Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of the RGM podcast with me, Carl Maloney, the host of The Shindig. We're here for another week and we've got a comedian on his hands, ladies and gentlemen, none other than Sarah Keyworth. Hi, mate. Hello. How are Hi, you? I'm fine, thanks, mate. Are you? Yeah, good, thank you. Not yeah, bad. brilliant. So where do we find you today at home? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm in my flat in North West London. That's North where West. I am today. Yeah. And yes. how's sunny London today? Do you know what? It is quite sunny, actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. nice blue skies. I'm, just, I'm used to rain up here in Manchester, and we've got nice blue skies as well. Yeah, it feels shocking, like the season. It? it feels like the season is just getting a little bit better, and we're going to have some nice uh, opportunities to be outside soon. I think. It feels like spring might be sprunging at the moment. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, yeah. we appreciate you joining us for the podcast. Um, mm. as, as a comedian, uh, we like we like to have a comedian on the show because, uh, as a failed comedian myself, I did try it about ten years ago on the circuit for a year. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. It, it's it's, <laughs> easy, it's easier now. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard. I've heard. Yeah. Fair yeah. Fair. Anyone? They let anyone in now. <laughs> <laughs> and because you're uh, and you know you're a comedian, so obviously you've got a podcast. I uh, obviously you have to, yeah. That's that the one as well. Uh, yeah. And we're, we're we're going to be discussing this amazing big tour you've got and the podcast shortly as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but just to start off with, I did have a listen to your last uh, uh, edition of your podcast. Yes. And on that, it's thank fuck for that. It's called. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, you, you were start you, you started off the podcast talking about how you wanted to look a bit more edgy, and you wanted <laughs> to look like you you're the type that could steal a baby, which I found an interesting <laughs> way to start a podcast. I feel like I communicated it wrong. This is the thing. <laughs> okay, I, I didn't represent myself well in that moment. I host it with my friend Mickey. Yeah. Mickey Overman, very talented comedian. Yeah. And um, sometimes she brings out the worst in me. I think. <laughs> yeah. but the, the point I was making was that I went to, I was in a, a tube station and I saw a woman with a baby in a pushchair. Yeah. Yeah. And I said to the woman, would you like help? And she said, yes, please. And then she gave me the baby. And I was saying that I felt a bit offended <laughs> that I look so harmless. Yes. She didn't think for a second that I would nick the baby. And I just thought that maybe I'd like to look a little bit more um, intimidating, yeah. um, which I think is completely reasonable and very fair. <laughs> yeah. um, but then Mickey said, so you're saying that you want to nick a baby. And I think I got swept away in it. And I think I did say I want to nick a baby. I think yeah. I think I I, I did say those words. It, it came across well eventually. Uh, context did it? me with them, yeah. those kind of statements, aren't they? I suppose. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So that's not the point I was trying to make, but it is the, <laughs> it is the words I ended up saying. So <laughs> it happens all the time. Well, I'm brand new to the podcast and I really enjoyed it. And we will come, <laughs> oh, good. We will Thank come you. to that eventually. It's great. <laughs> uh, so I just want to go, I always like to go back a little bit, particularly with comedians. Um, so let's just rewind a bit before, you know, you started on the professional uh, scene out there. Mm. Uh, when when did you start to realise that you've got funny bones in you? Um, I don't know, because I'm not I'm not the funniest person in my family. My dad's very uh, funny. My, my brother's very funny. And my mum's very funny. So um, so I, I, I think maybe I started making people laugh in school. Mm. Um, and then I start, I had mates saying you should you should try and do comedy, which is nice. Um, but I don't know when I think the moment I I don't even know if I've actually had a moment where I've realized that I I can actually do it. Um, I think, yeah, I think it started to kind of happen as a teenager. Uh, it's that classic comedian thing of um uh, make the joke about yourself before somebody else does. It's it's a bullying mechanism, you know, saving yourself from being yeah. bullied. It's just, it's it's a um, I was very bulliable in school. So like a lot of comedians, it doesn't come from a place of trauma or anything like that? <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, no. Um, five minutes in, do you have any trauma? Um, <laughs> no, I don't know. Not massive trauma, I suppose. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I don't know. A bully, being bullied is traumatic. I suppose. Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yes. But and I was I was prime. Um, I was prime uh, real estate for being bullied at school. So probably a bit of that. Okay. Okay. So, so were you, were your family, were they um, comedians? Did they ever try it or were they just naturally funny around the house? And... No, just naturally funny around the house. None yeah. of them would try stand up. I do have, I've got a, a cousin who's a writer and, and used to do stand up. Um, and I had, a, I think my great grandfather was a P- Piero, which is like a clown, like a, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like that. Piero, yeah. And, um, and one of my uncles, no, my, my dad's my great uncle my dad's uncle yeah. um he was an entertainer he was a 
comedy entertainer. His name was Charlie Bartle, and he used to perform in Nottingham with a little dog, apparently. Mm. And there's a plaque in Nottingham for him outside one of the theatres. Oh, nice. So, um, yeah, there's some there's some funny bones within the within the family. Bones, it, yeah. it, there's one thing to like think about doing comedy, but then there's another stage of actually going out and doing it and getting that first five minutes and finding out where you can do five minutes finding out if you can and just actually cracking on with it when did you where where did the drive come from you to think oh fuck this i'm just gonna have a go at this um I, I, when i was uh when i was in school i was well, like sixth form i had a go at it but i was really shit um and then I went to university and I met people doing it. So I thought, okay, I'll give it another go. Um, but it's it's really arrogant, isn't it? It's very arrogant to, to have a go at it. Like to, to have that moment of thinking, I'm gonna start, I can stand up in this room and make this these people laugh is um it's proper smug behavior, isn't it? <laughs> um so so yeah, I think if anybody's having those thoughts, um have a good hard look at yourself. <laughs> That's what highly unrecommended. Yeah, uh, I don't know, right? No. <laughs> Yeah, who do you think you are? Who do I think I am? <laughs> How did your first gig go, and where was it? Very first gig ever was in yeah. it, uh, was like a charity gig in in um, school. My friend was organising it, yeah. um, and it was the softest audience. Like 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 so easy. It was like my mom and dad and her mom and dad and my mates. Um, so I thought I was an absolute rock star by the end of it i was like i'm so good at stand-up comedy i don't know why this hasn't happened 10 years ago at the age of 17. um so yeah that was not an accurate representation of what stand-up comedy looks like and i have since then been uh, shown the reality of doing stand-up comedy which is often just struggling to make rooms full of people laugh uh, over and over again repeatedly until something hits well my my yeah. first go at it was a, a spiker mic gong show oh no way yeah, yeah. A, a gong show where if people don't yeah. know what they are, basically people are just gonna if they don't like you they're just gonna make it very obvious to you that they don't like you and kick you straight off the stage and the point is to get to like five minutes did you ever have any like an absolute brutal that? display of the, <laughs> yeah. the of the depths of uh, uh inhumanity isn't it really where <laughs> audience members get to judge people within a matter of seconds yeah. and often we'll just do go oh you know I don't like that guy's hair and knock you off <laughs> um it's uh yeah I've, I've done them I've done a few gong shows I did one um I did one in London quite early on in my career and uh I was the second act on mm. and first act went on survived the whole thing got through their five minutes and then the MC went on and said to the audience, oh, come on, guys, you've got to be harsher than that. <laughs> oh, great, okay. And I thought, well, I'm fucked. <laughs> I'm absolutely <laughs> fucked. There's no way they're not going to gong me off immediately because they've got to prove to the MC that they can be harsh. Yeah. So like, I, I, I was gone within seconds. Barely got a word out. <laughs> so if anybody doesn't know, the journey of a comedian usually starts, or it did when I had a go a few years ago. Tell me if this is if it's different these days but you know you just try and get stage time wherever you can you get five minutes you'll do the gong shows you'll you might know mm -hmm. somebody that's running a gig that's new to it themselves that will give you a bit of stage time just to try and hone your craft a little bit and try and get past these different little landmarks in comedy where you, you try and get five ten minutes twenty minutes and then go up to the pro levels and that kind of stuff how how did you find the journey of getting more established with it yourself personally um I think I was very lucky to be honest. Uh, I, had, I was doing really nice gigs. I was gigging quite solidly for about like a, a year and a half. I was gigging like most nights of the week mm. and I was completely exhausted. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, that was the process of just- um, How did you get to the stage of doing it every night though? Was, you know, being new to it, how did, how did that- That was, drive? that's just, I was very fortunate and then I lived in London. So I was just emailing right. out every gig yeah. that I went to, I would I'd talk to people and I'd say, um, uh, where should I go? Well, who should I email? Who should I get in touch with? And I had this big long list on my phone of all the different gigs in London and I was just emailing them out. I had an office job, but I was um, so bad at it that they didn't notice when I didn't do anything okay. productive. Yeah. Um, so I was just emailing like during office hours, just yeah. emailing out, um, trying to get spots and stuff. So I was just doing like, yeah, like unpaid open mic gigs and stuff, but every, every night of the week as much as I could. Um, which made me a terrible person to spend any time with socially because <laughs> I, I was falling asleep 
I was hanging out with mates, just falling, like just at, at dinner tables and just just crashing out because I was so exhausted. Um, and then uh, and then I guess yeah, after about a year and a half, I started getting a couple of like paid spots, but they were more like um like uh you know forty quid, ten minutes for forty quid kind of thing. Um, and then yeah, it sort of sort of built it from there. But that was oh god. Now, now I'm gonna to have to have a think about you know, the face with the reality of my age. It was about eight years ago. Yeah, I was doing that. So, so a lot of people don't realise when they see people on the telly the journey that you've been on. Mm. Uh, and usually for for a lot of comedians, it's a lot longer than eight years, isn't it? As well, you know, it could be ten, fifteen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had re relatively um, quick uh, mm. journey through. Yeah, when you com compare to some people who who slog away for for such a long time. Yeah, and, I've been uh, very fortunate. And I like to celebrate the graft that comedians go through in the early years as well. The commitment to doing it and being wherever you need to be at that night at a, a minute's notice, sometimes less. You know, you just mm -hmm. got to be across the road uh, to get another set in and just just to build your stage time and to hone your craft. It's so um, daft, though, isn't it? Because like <laughs> it's, it's mostly just somebody sat on a mega boss for like two or three years of the, your life. And it's great. I mean, you should say to people that like one day, you're yeah. going to be on a podcast and somebody's going to congratulate you for being on this mega bus. <laughs> <laughs> somebody's going to say, well done for getting on that mega bus for seven hours to Liverpool. And uh, just deleting been... the question about the mega bus in Liverpool question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. man. Why, why do you think it was quicker for you than maybe other people's journey? Um, I think maybe sometimes it's just right place, right time. Um, I think. Uh, I'm, I mean, I don't, I don't really know. Um, yeah. you, you can't, I can't answer. Good. I can't say anything. Yeah, I can't say anything about. I can't be like because I'm fucking great. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've just got an innate talent. Um, <laughs> no, I think sometimes it's just right place, right time. And I um, had had the means. I got, as I say, I had this job that I, meant that I was able to move to London. And I think sometimes it's just as simple as where you are geographically, like yeah. moving to London and meeting the right people. It's it's. Um, uh, when you're starting out doing comedy uh, like being able to gig every night of the week in in London is um kind of transformative and uh quite frustratingly it's, it's kind of getting better now but the comedy industry is a little bit London centric so um being here made me um it put me in a position to sort of meet meet people who were gonna offer me gigs and recommend my name to other people and then enter London-based competitions and get seen by agents and stuff like that so yeah you, you Lond know. london is the reason london the bright lights of london we blame london <laughs> for, for what i now inflict upon the world yeah. you, you mentioned earlier that that, that fascinated me a bit i just I'm, I'm glad i parked it in my own mind there a little bit that you feel it might be a little bit easier these days to start as a comedian than back eight ten years ago what, what, what did you mean by that? i was just joking to make you feel better um, <laughs> that's that's all that was Fair it's enough. um i think it, i actually think it's probably harder okay um, well, there's more of us. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's lo yeah, loads of comedians now. Um, and um, I think you have to be a bit more creative to be a comedian now, to, to stand yeah. out. Um, yeah. In some ways, it's, there's, it's easier to grow an audience in that you're not relying on being booked for TV and things like that. You can just put mm. stuff online and grow. Um, so yeah. that's, that's good. But um, I think you're, in order to kind of rise, to rise above everyone else, you do have to be doing something a little bit distinctive hmm. it's probably just as hard as it was i don't know i wasn't yeah. there no yeah fair enough well you, you do see a lot of like reels from comedians these days and online mm. content and videos and that kind of stuff just one that stands out for me is tony uh, hawk uh, troy hawk sorry uh, that's yes just, yeah <laughs> tony hawk i was like is he doing stand-up now <laughs> sorry that's that's, that's me yeah. that's the, give us a chance tony <laughs> yeah, stick, stick to the board <laughs> sorry troy hawk my troy love. hawk yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, is he doing online stuff now? Yeah, do, doing the Greeters Guild. I'm kidding. Oh, fuck. Oh, here we go. I'm kidding. I've seen him. I've seen him. Greeters yeah. Guild. Yeah. Yeah. He's good. It's very yeah, good. no, it, it, it's just, it, it's fascinating. It's always fascinating me, the, the, the comedian uh, mentality of, you know, just because it, it didn't use to be self promotion, used to be uh, frowned upon when when i started like 10 years ago they were like because I, I i thought about doing a website and somebody said that's the last thing you want to do like have a website and that kind of stuff when why when, what's wrong yeah, with a website 
I, I don't particularly know. I'm from a music background. So I was in bands and stuff before where you, you kind of needed to have that kind of self-promotion and self-promotion. Yeah, I don't see the harm of doing it as a comedian. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, a lot of people like, like frown, didn't like that. I was like self-promoting myself. Probably I was too early and not committed to the, uh, to the craft of stand-up comedy and, you know. Too busy building the website, yeah. Yeah, well, maybe, yeah. Well, there's a reason why I don't do it anymore because I weren't very good at it. And, yeah. Uh, and but it, what it did. Do you get, have a website now? Yeah, uh, RGM. It's it, it it when I started off in comedy, it kind of um, sent me on a journey, and it is my uh, my own personal um, journey. Really, is my um, you know what's the name of the, my thank fuck for that moment was starting off in comedy and not getting away with it, but. It kind of made me out of my comfort zone. I started to do stand up. I got offered a film in London mm. that we did. It, after I, after I did it for a bit, I got a bit of a name self in Sheffield, where it introduced me to introducing band gigs. So I got back into music, being a compare interviewing bands and that kind of stuff. Nice. So I started a website, and it's organically changed to RGM what it is now. Just it, uh, RGM wouldn't be here if I wouldn't have been rubbish at stand up ten years ago. So that I was, just think if, if they if you'd listened to them and not made that website, where could uh, you be? You know, yeah. that's changed your life. Yeah, it really has, and uh, you know, it's it's why we're here today, and it's why I like celebrating personalities in the world and just doing these podcasts and just having interesting people with interesting chats with new people on the internet with yourself. Yeah. So I've done a bit of little digging as well. I've done a bit of research, Sarah. Um, okay. And um, just looking at just on your website and that kind of stuff um done quite a lot of tv work mate i, I, I really enjoyed seeing some of the stuff you do and some and panel shows always fascinate me mm. they on the on, as as a person like if i ever got booked for a panel show i think this is going to be tough yeah be quite a lot of preparation for those type of things because the competition even on the show looks brutal even before yeah. you start recording how, how do you find those the panel shows no, you're absolutely right. You 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 got it. You bang on. It's it's tough. The the they're a very specific skill, mm. um, and I think I think sometimes you kind of either got it or you don't. I, I'm not sure if I fully have it with panel show. I try my best, and I think I've had some good appearances on them. Yeah. Um, but they are. I mean, some of the the best comedians around will say that that format doesn't suit me, mm. um, because I'm I'm a bit. I think my sense of humor is a bit like quiet and I draw an audience in and maybe a bit more sort of subtle like facial expressions and things like that um I use a lot of silence you know like you use pauses and uh, timing in, in in doing stand-up um and you can't do that on a panel show you've just got to be the loud kind of loudest fastest uh most dominant person in the room at times um especially if you're new because people are looking at you going we don't even know who the fuck you are um so yeah they, they are challenging it's a challenging format to, to try and um a comedy it's sad it's kind of sad to make comedy as competitive as as yeah. they make it yeah they do fast so I, I presume you get like just before the show you get uh ideas of what's going to be discussed on it so you can think of the material to to, to come out with that. I presume that's a thing. No, it's entirely improvised. Really... <laughs> it's all, it's all, all improvised. That's that's what we're told to tell you. Um, <laughs> we have no idea what's going to happen. No, yeah, yeah, so. they, they do send, they send it out. They send you yeah. this yeah, send sure. you a piece of paper saying this is what's going to happen. Yeah. So like on, on Mock the Week, even though, because that just looks so competitive, even when, you, when you're just walking into the middle bit and you, and you even see comedians clashing into each other to get to that mic. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That looks like the worst part of it that like, for, for me is like like kind of knowing the the journey of comedians and that kind of stuff like when i'm watching it on the telly it feels awkward sometimes when people crash into each other wanting to get to that microphone it's brutal isn't it yeah and it's just not within my personality like i wouldn't do that on like trying to get on a train or anything like i'm always <laughs> i'm always I have, to, I have to very subservient so it's quite hard because you you do have to just go you have to kind of yeah. go i'm going to go next um and it's and it's different and the people who have kind of been doing it for years they know that and they instinctively will just move when they want to move um so yeah you have to kind of change the the wiring of your brain and go fuck it i'm gonna fucking rugby tackle glenn moore to the floor now <laughs> um which you know is actually worth it <laughs> yeah fair enough, fair enough. yeah and it's no mean feat because he's a no. tall man but <laughs> he deserves it yeah what, what's your favorite part of um doing tv because obviously uh, you've done the apollo as well which is like the the holy grail from a comedian coming up point of view to to do the live at the apollo yeah 
just watching your performance on there, just so accomplished. And, you know, it felt like you had the, the crowd in the palm of your hand straight away. Speak, speak, oh, thank you. Speak, speaking to Scott Bennett, I know he'd, he'd been on it recently and he was just telling me about the build up to it. How, how was your personal build up to that first appoint, uh, you know, um, appearance on such an iconic programme? Um, well, I was really sick. I had a oh. really bad cold. Yeah. Um, so that was stressful in itself because you think this is one of the biggest moments of my career. I've been dreaming about this day for my entire life. And within those dreams, I didn't have a runny nose and a sore throat. Um, so I, I had a whiskey before I went on just to try and hot whiskey. Um, and it's ner- it is nerve wracking that you get, you, they drive to your house and pick you up in a car and you, th- you feel like you're being taken to, away <laughs> you think what's going to happen um but it's like it was it was great it was so cool it's um it's very exciting and everybody's really lovely and all stuff like that my favorite part about it was that was at the end because my girlfriend and my friend were there and um uh they came back with me to just grab my stuff from my dressing room and i've never seen two people loot a dressing room with such excitement because they give you snacks and stuff so okay. like, can, can no they weren't taking the furniture but there's like cans of coke and crisps and sweets and things but my girlfriend I've never seen anything like it she had like a sack full of goodies by the end of it did she and take thought, a bag just in case sorry did she take a bag with her just in case yeah she had a bag with her as well and she had yeah. everything in it and I just I thought this is honestly probably one of the most glamorous moments of my life and we're all from Nottingham my partner and I and, and my friends are all from Nottingham and stuff and I thought this is just the most like typical th- like the most exciting <laughs> moment at Hammersmith Apollo in London performing it live at the Apollo it feels like a real I've made it moment but we are still absolute scumbags <laughs> we are still robbing the place of everything that's not strapped down um so yeah it was uh, it was good fun it was a good night how do you find coming down from those type of experiences oh it happens quite quickly I don't I've not, I've not got anybody in my life who really indulge me if I'm trying to uh, uh, right, pre- okay. pretend to be a diva or anything like that I think I think I was probably um I don't know cleaning the windows the next day yeah. um yeah it did I, I don't think uh, that high I mean, obviously I can be excited and my family and my partner there everybody just sort of celebrate with me but um it, they don't they don't treat me any any differently so um i i come down within a matter of hours i think <laughs> okay. yeah no it's, it's, it's just such great landmarks in a career uh, of a comedian so it's, mm. so you built up your stage time um doing gigs all the time knackering stuff gradually built up to doing headline gigs and that kind of stuff get yep. start to get tally work established you've got your own full tour coming out as well which is which is amazing mm. uh, just sticking on the journey of uh, on the life of a comedian a little bit um cancel culture i know um you know it's a it's a podcast with comedians i suppose uh we might as well address it How, what, what's your theory on cancel culture at the minute for, for me it feels like it's easier now to discuss what you want than what it was like a year ago when a, a year ago it felt like there was a lot of pressure on comedians coming out of the pandemic to um to regain control of the world really and start saying what they want <laughs> how they want is a bit of an observation uh, i've got personally um yeah i mean um i don't really think I, I think it's I think the attitude around council uh, council culture is kind of uh, um, bullshit really mm. in that um, nobody's really been cancelled for saying anything yeah sort of people can kind of say what they want and then they get you know get on with it yeah. um, I mean people there are people who have literally done things that are illegal that are still touring um so I I don't know I don't know really I think um I think what we talk about when we talk about sort of cancel culture or people being yeah. afraid to talk about things is is um I find it it's, it's often when you see comedians who are just um incapable of moving with culture mm. they're ignoring the fact that uh, 10 years ago, five years ago, even it might have been okay to say one thing, but 
the world has moved on and we maybe learned more we're more educated maybe we understand like that would saying that thing would be damaging or hurtful to this kind of group of people or that kind of group of people and it's not um you can't say anything these days it's just why not be a bit more uh, interesting and nuanced and sensitive about what you're actually talking about yeah. rather than just going for like the most because the, the the reason that people make these jokes that um that get like a shock reaction are often because they're sort of the most uh, basic or boring punchlines that just generate a bit of a shock response. Mm. And I just think, um, I think if you're looking at a joke thinking, uh, oh, people, people aren't going to like it if I go out and say this because it's going to upset this group of people or hurt that group of people, it's offensive to this group of people. Um, if you think you're so good at comedy, mm -hmm write a better joke yeah oh well said well said do you have, have you ever edited your material yeah um, yeah but like, I, I presume it's normal to edit your material if you're doing telly than just a club uh, for sure i mean i i've done it a, a yeah. lot i've written jokes that i've thought were funny i've gone out and done them i've got a message from someone and said hey i like you know i like the performance but there's this one line that you said that um i think maybe came across badly or wasn't quite mm. met with the right tone or um was said with a bit of ignorance and i thought okay fair enough and there are times when i've when i've had to adapt and i've changed what i've said and um and i i to be honest i I, I'm proud of those moments in the sense that I've written a better joke. I've written a more nuanced joke. And the fact that I'm capable of taking a bit of material going, okay, well, I don't want to hurt anyone. So what's my way around? I can still talk about the yeah. subject. What's my way around hurting people? All right, then I'll do that instead. That's just simple. It's just it was a mark of a talented comic yeah. if you can awesome. adapt. And I wrote a show in 2018. And then I filmed it for a special in 2021. And I've said this a lot. I went and listened back to the recordings of the show in 2020, uh, 2018 to record it in 2020. And the first five minutes of that show were not appropriate for the way that culture had moved on yeah. in the three years since I'd done it. Like it just, it was, it, the, the tone had shifted because uh, my show was about gender and stuff like that. And I made a few jokes that now I wouldn't do. That I wouldn't want to do because I, I my opinions have changed I've learned more attitudes towards things have changed and so I rewrote them and it's just like I hate this whole thing of like you can't say anything anymore and it's like well you can you can say lots of there's so many things that you can say yeah but if you're dead if the only way that you can be humorous is by being offensive yeah. and you're not that funny no I, I, well said and you know it the the media the, there's a lot of scaremongering in the uh, in the media i think around all sorts of different topics and you only have to i was watching the bbc earlier on today um and they were just talking about how the church aren't going to bless same sex man marriages you know just that kind of story being main the main story uh, in the news you know trying to <laughs> discuss these type of topics in that kind of like confrontational way because you you don't get conversations like this on the news you just get rah 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 mm. um, and it's it, it this type of quick clickbaity news um it, it's not helping conversations it's it's not helping move things forward and uh, giving people alternate ways to think about it if they do think a certain way i just find and, it wild and, i find it kind of crazy that um that that we that there's this attitude that that everybody has this sort of like uh like a, 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 like undeniable right mm. to hurt people if they want to i can say whatever i want it's just my opinion and it's like well yeah it's your opinion but like why do you want to be somebody that upsets people like even if you do don't really understand their way of life or who they are or you don't you, you're not gay you don't want a same-sex marriage or anything like that what what is it about causing other people suffering that gets you off and i think that's um i just think it kind of it's kind of lame i don't know it's, just, it's, like it's you, know, you only have to mention just pronouns in a public environment and 
<laughs> all the, all these people lose the shit over her pronouns when I, I I don't fully understand why they're so angry about other people just wanting to be described as whatever they want to be described as. The the debate around pronouns is far more effortful than actually just leaving people alone. <laughs> yeah, it is. There's so much. Yeah, they, they talk about it too much, don't they? But yeah. Just, you know, what's it matter? Why does it matter to that person? Yeah. When, you know, I... it takes up way more of your brain space and your, your time to like argue with somebody about their pronouns than it does to just like call them <laughs> what they want and move on with your yeah. life. Yeah. Have, uh, have you ever had spats like that on Twitter and that kind of stuff with people? How, how, how do you find social media, the environment? And... I try my best to stay out of it because yeah. I find it very sort of frustrating. And um, yeah, so I don't uh, I don't wade into spats. I don't read comments. I put out what I want to put out into the world. And um, I've I had a bit of a period last year where I think I felt quite frustrated because I thought like I just I just wanted to be a stand up comedian. That's when I started when I started doing comedy. I wanted to just be just make people laugh. And part of that was talking about who I am and my existence in my life. And my existence is political, wh- whether I like it or not, um, because uh, some people don't think that I should have the same rights as other people. Um, and that's like, it's kind, of, it's kind of a frustrating reality to be faced with. So like, I'm I'm not the same as like Ivo Graham. I'm not the same as Glenn Moore because they can go out and just be funny. They can talk about whatever they want. But if I put a post, you know, if I put a video of me online, people want to know what gender I am. That's what, that's the comments are. So I have to, like my, there's no avoiding it with me. I have to address it within my stand-up. I have to address it with it whenever everything I do all of the time, I have to address it. And um, so I, yeah, I try my best to kind of keep my head because otherwise you wouldn't want to do anything. So I just, um, yeah, I stay away from it as much as possible. I don't wade into conversation. Sometimes I will, sometimes I'll, I, you know, I post things and put my opinions online, but I'm not, I'm not about to get into an argument with anybody. I know that I'm right. <laughs> That, I know. That, that I know. Is it frustrating to have to do that still now? You're more established, and is it still is it frustrating for you to have? To... Well, I'm not. I'm not so famous that I think everybody should know who I am. So yeah, I'm, yeah, sure. You know, I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm having a successful career, and I have fans that come and see me, and that's lovely. But I'm not. A, you know, I'm not a, a massive household name. I'm not a, like world famous in any way. So I. I don't mind reintroducing myself to people because that's. I'm not. I'm not so arrogant as to think that everybody should completely understand. And if people have legitimate questions that are just because they are trying to get a sense of me, then that's fine. But, um, but I, I think what I find frustrating is that um, the, the, the way in which we handle sort of identity politics and the attitudes towards queer people and the attitudes towards gender uh, mean that I, I have a responsibility to uh, be some kind of representative or advocate of my community, as well as trying to be a stand-up comedian. Yeah, and uh, that's um, that's kind of boring. <laughs> no, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. It it feels like it's a, it, it's important for you though to uh, to take you know to to take that on, to take on that mantle and run with it too and support. Um, your community. Yes, yes, it is. It is important, but as I say, it's also kind of you know um, uh, inevitable. Yeah. Like I can't. Um, they would. There would always be the the questions would always be there. Yeah. So. So how do you? So you've got the uh, Lost Boy tour coming. Mm. Up. Is it is it an hour? Is it a, a, a specials are generally about an hour to turn out? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. So it's an hour um, full show. Uh, I've been kind of alternating between doing um, a, the warm up myself and having um, a, a support, depending on how I'm feeling. So I might I, it will be like a show of two halves, but it'll be a short spot at the front, at the top, and then um, and then me doing an hour, which is the full show. Um, so the yeah, the whole thing is like an an hour and a half with a break. What always fascinates me when I watch specials, and I watch a lot of them. I've been to see a lot of comedy recently. I went to see Rich Wilson's in Manchester, his, mm. his last special. And just to be Did able, he have a tour support? Uh, he, it was part of, uh, it was a recording, uh, it was recorded. So they uh, had a, a couple of other comedians doing half an hour before he did his hour. 
Yes, I saw one with a rush get a horse pump. <laughs> I should think about this. I'll think about this privately on my own. Okay, yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Um, uh, yeah, so, you know, just, uh, it, it always fascinates me. How do you remember to talk about all the things that you talk about for an hour? So when I've spoke to other comedians in the past, they've all got their own different techniques of doing it. They gradually, some might just build up 20 minutes on the road, yeah. build up another 20 minutes on the road and then stitch it together and alter it and play with it at all times. What's your personal method of building up this uh, big chunk of content that's, in your mind, ready to go. Um, like we're memorizing it. Yeah, well, yeah, just the whole process of being able to have an hour um, of comedy in you just to go out and do. Well, I'm starting to write a new one now, so I just write bits. I just, I just think, you know, anytime I have an idea about something that might be funny, I'll just make a little note in my phone, and then I'll maybe like write the bit and stuff, and then, um, I do like new material nights. Maybe I'll do like a ten or fifteen minute spot, and I'll try some of the ideas, and I'll, you know, I'll be stood there going, yeah, okay, that's kind of working, and then I'll do stuff like work in progress shows. So I'll do an hour, but it'll be me with a bit of paper, kind of trying to figure out what's what's good and what's not. Um, and that's li literally relying on the the notes as a bit of a crutch and like and being very honest with the audience and saying this is a work in progress show some of this stuff is going to be funny and some of it's going to be absolute dog shit mm -hmm. um and uh i do as many of them as possible and then you have like a deadline so it might be going to the edinburgh fringe or maybe you're recording a special or something like that but you're like this this show needs to be finished so you you gradually start to work out which which bits are working and which bits need to go and which things need rewriting and what gaps there are that need um new jokes entirely um and then i sometimes will work with a director so we'll kind of structure it to tell a, tell a story or, or um flow in a way that sort of makes satisfying sense um and then by that point you've done it so many times that you do just you'll know the routines and there might be times when you do it and you go fuck I was supposed to do this bit there and that's I've missed that but then you you I don't think you often make those mistakes um over and over again like once you know you might know the the opening 20 is like sorted and you'll go right okay well at the 30 minute mark I need to switch that over and and you'll be aware of the things you need to change um and then like if you're taking a show to edinburgh by the time you finish doing the edinburgh fringe festival you will have done that show about 25 times in a row and by that point i've memorized it like song lyrics like yeah. you finish one joke and you know the next like you know when like a song finishes on an album and you know you know what the next song is because you've heard that transition so many times um it's just pure so graft and and le learning from on the spot uh, feedback from your audience in it there's no secret to come yeah up. it's basically grafting and yeah it's just doing that. it over and over there's not really a shortcut I think like you're seeing this now which is I think is really interesting and, and kind of cool is that like there are people who are getting really fit like famous and big from maybe doing like little comedy videos online um and then a few of them now have like booked in tours and they're also booking in loads of work in progress shows because they're like I need to I need to put the hours in to learn how to be a stand-up before I go on this massive tour, but they've sold out this tour. So people are kind of doing it like backwards, yeah. um, which I think is really, I think it's cool. I, I kind of respect the people that are like, I'm, I'm not going to just go out there and, and wing it. I'm, I'm going to give these paying audience members a good show. So I'm going to learn how to be a stand-up before I go out in front of them. Yeah. So titles for specials or tours can sometimes be a bit spurious. And um, how, how did you, it, it, you know, Lost Boy Tour, tickets are available mm. now. There's, there's, there's a link in the description of this podcast to grab yourself a ticket. And you're going to be in my hometown uh, of Sheffield at the Lead Mill on Wednesday, the 22nd of February too. Yes. Um, so, you know, a, a, an iconic venue like the Lead Mill um as part of this you know nationwide tour uh what does the title mean give us a clue why you picked that as a title for your tour. um oh god i can't remember <laughs> Fair um enough. i don't know i think sometimes you just pick something yeah it's got a bit of a meaning to it now but that's a bit of a spoiler okay fair um enough. but i can't remember whether it was named that before the thing happened or whether it was coincidentally quite useful that that was, it was called that i think it was it was maybe it was named that for a reason yeah. um uh but usually a lot of the time i did a show called pacific and that was based on a routine there was a, I had a little joke that had that word in it but i just thought it was a good it was a fun word 
Mm. Um, and sometimes you just pick something that sounds because because when if you're doing the Edinburgh Fringe, you often have to pick the name of your show before you've started writing it because yeah. you have to submit and you have to um, register for the the festival. So people just you'll often get audience members going, I don't know why it's called. Um, you often get uh, comedians going, I don't know why this is called that. I just you I, can't I just had that to... later on. No, I just had to pick it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, fair enough. That's Which is why often they're very vague. No, no, I can imagine. Yeah. So, you know, if people haven't clicked the button yet to come and see you on tour, Sarah, what would you say to the people that are just hovering over that ticket link now, considering to, whether to buy a ticket for you? Um, click, click it. Just, what, <laughs> okay. just, just click it. Why don't you yeah. click it? This is yeah. we're, we're having a nice time. It's going to be fun. I'll make you laugh. You can find out why it's called Lost Boy. Yeah. Um, uh, and if you come in in Sheffield, then uh, uh, that'd be lovely. I've I've not been to Sheffield in years, and I've never been to the lead mill. But they've moved me into the bigger space at the lead oh, mill, so I really I'm going to need all the help I can get because um, it was the smaller space, and then that sold out, and now it's bigger. Um, so um, so don't basically I'd say please don't make me look stupid in that big room. Yeah, <laughs> That's what I'd say and if, you're ho- if you're hovering. Then I need you more than you need me, so please. Well, I want to catch you because I'm from Sheffield originally, but I live in Manchester now, so I want mm. to book it one. So I love the frog. Lovely. And book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm at the frog and book it in Manchester. There you go. And where yeah. else are you? All over the country as well? I'm doing – Um. so uh, quite a few of them are sold out, yeah. but um, uh, nice. the one, the ones that aren't sold out uh, is Belfast tomorrow night, but this is not going to go out before that. So, uh, what a useless piece of information. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's like, it's got a, like a like a, a, only a few tickets left. Um, and then what else? Uh, Sheffield and Birmingham. I got moved into bigger rooms, which is why they're not. So they've they've got tickets left. And um, London is a big old. That's a big old theatre. So there's a few tickets left for that, and that's on the nineteenth of March at the Bloomsbury Theatre. Um, so yeah, not uh, many dates have any tickets left. So the, the if you're hovering, yes. Stop hovering. Stop hovering. And the podcast, because again, we mentioned right at the beginning of this chat that, you know, you mm. could, every comedian's got a podcast. Everybody's got a podcast these days, uh, good or bad. How, how do you find being a podcaster uh, yourself personally? What made you start doing it? Um, I think it's great. I think it's good for, I mean, I do it with a friend. My favourite thing in the world to do. I love them. I love, yeah, I do. I make it with my friend, Mickey, who's, she's so funny. She's such a good stand-up <laughs> comedian. Um, so it's the nice. worst in you, don't you, mate? It's, uh, so, it, sounds like, it sounds like she brings out the worst in you. She does, yeah. She absolutely does. She provokes it, um, yeah. and she's she's very funny. She makes me laugh a lot. So it's nice just getting to hang out with her, um, and it's great just having um, like stuff to think about. It kind of gets you thinking about comedy in a different way, and um, and uh, it, it's about like near near misses, like because it's called Thank Fuck for that, and it's about um, you, you uh, guests will come on and tell a story about something they're glad didn't happen and then something that they're glad that that did happen so to thank fuck for that moment um uh we've got some very loose uh sliding doors the film with Gwyneth Paltrow um uh themes running through in that we call it the sliding doors moment is the second one is a thank fuck for that moment and a sliding doors moment but mostly people um then complain that uh everything is technically a sliding doors moment um but we're, we're just you know you just have to have some kind of format so that's what we did um uh, but some of the stories are wild some of the, the near misses the the thank fuck that didn't happen um stories are uh are wild um and quite uh harrowing well the, the last one i watched was stuart goldsmith when he was talking about uh, walking through um South Africa, and he got into a hairy moment, and yeah, yeah, just about, just about got away with it, and went. And off he, the he tells that story, and it like <laughs> like your heart starts racing. And you're like, yeah. Oh God, what is going to happen here? Um, yeah, so they're they're really good, and some of the stories are unbelievable. So definitely, how, how do you prepare for like? How do you put? How definitely will do. And if you want to hear that story about what he did in uh, South Africa, I'll put a link to the podcast, so it'll take you straight there on the description of this one too. Thank you. Uh, yeah, here we go. Uh, some homework, uh, homework for you all there, listeners. So um, yeah, so as a podcaster yourself, then how do you fully prepare for interviews yourself? Because I've, I've been doing interviewing quite a long time, and I still think 
I, I still think I'm blagging it. I still think, you know, I shouldn't be here. Um, I feel I'm bad. shit at it. I'm really <laughs> shit at interviewing people. I'm really bad. Mickey and I are absolute dog shit. Like the <laughs> amount of apologies and, and stuff that we have to edit out because we're just, we do, I don't know how to start a podcast. You you were really good today. You just started oh, talking. Good. But I, I, I feel like a goon at the beginning. Like I really don't know what to do. So <laughs> the answer is I don't prepare and then I um, I feel I'm very ashamed of myself afterwards. One, one thing that never changes for me, and, and it happened before, you know, because w- when you're meeting people for the first time on Zoom, it's a bit of a strange thing to uh, to do, isn't it? You know, I'm speaking to this new person that I've never met before in my life and who knows how it's going to go. I always think the worst because she's going to hate me. Uh, I'm going to say the wrong thing. I'm going to drop a bollock. You get yeah. that fight of, but the flight mm. or fight mode inside mm. you where your body's just telling you to run. <laughs> it happens with me every time. Yeah. And I do run. I do hate you. I do. I hate <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna leave I'm gonna leave here and slag you off. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. How, That's not true. How, how do you find it like, you know, before you're before you uh, go live with somebody for the first time you um, before, I mean, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, at the moment, I just think I've been booking people that I'm friends with, so I guess that yeah, helps. Enough, yeah. um, I've, we've not done one yet with anyone that we've never ever met in our lives, so that's, um, I guess, that's reassuring. Um, and then we record in a in a in a studio in Vauxhall that is basically a shipping container on stilts. So nice. um, once you're in there, I think you um, you're so apologetic about what you've put them through already. Um, I'd, lo- I'd love to go to a can. face-to-face environment like what you've got on yours yeah 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 it's a, it's, it's a lot different than doing it on zoom zoom's very convenient and you know mm. you, you can get um you know you can get more guests because it's more convenient for everybody to just do it on zoom but there's a special thing about doing it face-to-face isn't there? There's a different yeah you can kind of hear the, the the energy in the room i think mm. i don't know i just said that it sounded wanky <laughs> Um, you're a podcaster now, mate. You're yes, an, uh, an established yeah. podcaster. There you go. Yeah, uh, what, I just felt that felt like the right thing to say. That, that. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. What was your thank fuck for that moment? Uh, oh, crikey. Um, I should have thought about this given it's my podcast. Um, well, because uh, because we've got to call a uh, thank fuck for that moment. Um, there's a few of them. Um, oh, god, it's hard to know, isn't it? Gosh, and I put people, people through this every week. Um, Something that I'm really glad yeah. didn't happen or did happen. Whatever you want. Well, I've had a few misses, near misses. I had, mm. had a car accident. I've told that story on the podcast. Um, so I've had a few of them. Um, something that I'm glad did happen. Um, uh, this is uh, this is so lame. And I can, uh, the only reason I'm saying it is because it's the only thing I can think of. Um, but I... My partner and I have been together like a couple of years, but we've known each other over 10 years. Um, and I think like meeting her was definitely a, a thank fuck for that moment because she's uh, been very transformative in my in my life, like as a friend and also um, in a relationship. So, yeah, but oh, uh, um, so that's nice. We could beep all that out, mate. All the all the slushy stuff. We'll beep all that out. Yeah, right? just make me sound cool. <laughs> I was thinking about a mo- yeah. yeah, buying my motorcycle was <laughs> my the best moment of my life. <laughs> I know what you mean that there's nothing better than having a uh, for me wife and you your girlfriend uh, somebody that improves you because I I feel like I've been improved by my pencil. They're good, aren't they? People, other people are nice, aren't they? And, yeah. and when you meet a good one, they uh, it does work, doesn't it? Yeah, it does work. I sound like a robot now. <laughs> better, better. A full oh. robot. Oh, that's yeah. I like people <laughs> as much as the next human being. Yeah. well sarah i've really enjoyed getting to know you um uh, everybody to click on if you're hovering over that link and you haven't clicked yet click now um come see sarah on tour uh an amazing comedian um you're working hard you've grafted you know you've got to celebrate I'm working so you. hard over here <laughs> yeah but you're, you're, you're so in belfast hard. tomorrow so you're having a break yeah. now before your next that's that's next true summer, aren't you mate I've been having a break for the whole of 2023, but I am in Belfast. <laughs> I'm in Belfast tomorrow. Well, good um, luck for the tour, mate. I'm really appreciate you joining us. Cheers, Carl. Thanks very much. Good night. Cheers.